All right, now we're live. All right, so my name is Chris Berry. We do this wisdom webinar each week, uh, same time every Wednesday, one o'clock. And then uh, if you ever can't make it, we do uh, post these on our YouTube channel. And the way it works is that uh, I'll send out an email and people will submit questions that they want us to kind of answer uh, in this type of format. So if you ever have questions, uh, feel free to email them over ahead of time. Uh, this week, there's really only one question that was submitted ahead of time. Uh, it's a juicy one, so it will take up some time. But if you do have any other questions uh, in terms of legal and financial and tax and income planning and healthcare planning and long-term care planning, uh, or really any questions, um, I'll take a shot at answering it live. Sometimes you might ask a question. I might not know the answer right off the top of my head, but I'll always follow up to get that answer for you. So if you do have questions, feel free to put that into the question and answer section. And each week I like to start, and we do this with uh, our radio show that we do. I do this with my own family as we sit down for dinner. Uh, start with a positive focus. Uh, we, we were doing this prior to the pandemic and prior to 2020. Uh, we've done it in our team meetings, but I think it's even more important uh, with all the craziness going on in the world. It's very easy to get depressed and, and uh, down uh, with uh, how 2020 might not be going the way that you want. Uh, so we start with a positive focus, just something positive that happened uh, over the last week. And uh, for me, it's pretty easy uh, having Thanksgiving, spending it with family, seeing my parents, um, having kids and uh, just it felt like a, a, a good Thanksgiving. We had a, a lot of the classics. Uh, I smoked a turkey on the Traeger grill uh, about eight hours, came out perfectly, probably the best turkey I ever smoked. Uh, we even turned those leftovers into uh, uh, the next morning. We used the stuffing and made an uh, omelet with the stuffing out of this cookbook that we had about leftovers. And then we had uh, poison turkey lettuce wraps. Uh, because you have all these leftovers, so it's trying to think of kind of creative ways to uh, make those leftovers last as long as possible. So uh, that's my positive focus, uh, just enjoying Thanksgiving. All right, and we have uh, someone submitting a question already, and so I do appreciate that. Uh, and if you do have questions, again, put them into the question and answer, and I'll take a shot at answering those questions. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we'll get into it, assuming technology cooperates with us. And I'm going to hit the share button. And now we're sharing in just a moment. Um, all right, so now we should be seeing my white screen. We should be, but it doesn't look like we are. So give me one more second. Now we are, there we go. All right, technology is great when it works. All right, so again, just again, uh, general disclaimer, uh, don't rush out and apply these strategies. Uh, this is general information. If you wanna see how it applies to your situation, uh, feel free to reach out uh, and always you can schedule some time on my calendar to talk about anything that we're talking about by just going to this website 15chris.com and magically through the powers of technology it books some time uh, free time on my calendar uh, which is filling up uh, especially with the holidays so with that uh, our first uh, and only question submitted ahead of time and i do see the question that uh, was just submitted uh, roth conversions pros and cons um, and, and this is something that we're spending a lot of time talking to people about uh, because we're that near the end of the year and it's almost getting near the deadline of when we can even consider doing this at the end of the year, just because financial institutions are slowing down, we're having a lot of holidays, uh, that type of thing. But the idea is, and I've covered this uh, before, but I think this is really one of the, the big areas of concern for families, uh, or it should be moving forward is this idea of taxes and tax risk. And we've talked about the different types of buckets we have in terms of taxable accounts. We have taxable accounts, which are things like your checking, savings, money markets, uh, CDs, brokerage accounts. Um, we have our tax deferred. So your tax deferred bucket of money, this is like your traditional IRAs, uh, 401ks, 403bs, and then we have our tax-free bucket. And in our tax-free bucket, we have the classic Roth 
IRA, the Roth 401k, uh, cash value, life insurance, index universal life insurance, uh, 529s, they have to be used for education, and health savings accounts. So there's a couple things uh, going on in, in, on why a lot of people are considering moving money from the tax deferred bucket to the tax free bucket, or from the tax deferred bucket to the taxable bucket or from the taxable bucket over to the tax-free bucket. And uh, the first thing in, is, in this, we've been talking about this probably since about 2015. Um, and the first reason why uh, I would say one of the pros of looking at a strategy, and not just Roth conversions, there's other strategies out there, uh, but I, I think of this as just getting more tax efficient, diversifying, between these different tax buckets. And there's more strategies than just a Roth conversion. That's the simplest one to easy and easiest to understand. You take money from the Roth or from the traditional IRA, uh, you move it over to the Roth. You can either withhold or pay taxes out of uh, another bucket. Um, but why, why have we been talking about this? So really what started me on this path of, of looking at taxes is the amount of debt the country has. So Prior to this year, coming into 2020, we had $23 trillion worth of debt. And so this was something in our in-person workshops, we were talking about um, the taxes are gonna have to go up somehow because we can't keep growing this debt bubble. At some point, the interest is just gonna eat away at everything. Well, now, uh, after 2020, uh, with, the whole pandemic, the, um, the uh, CARES Act, they had another $2.2 .2 trillion, all the additional spending we've had, uh, we're gonna come out of 2020, maybe $30 trillion in debt. And uh, the government is looking at ways to raise funds to address this. And they're doing it on its face by potentially raising marginal tax rates in the future, and I'll talk about that. And then also they're doing stealth taxes taxes that don't appear necessarily to raise your taxes, but in the end they do. Uh, and we had a big one with that, uh, with, the, with the SECURE Act. And the SECURE Act uh, says that when you inherit an IRA, you can only stretch out the, the tax deferral uh, now up to 10 years. And so what that tells me is they're coming after these beneficiaries who are inheriting pre-tax IRAs or 401ks or 403bs, now the beneficiaries are gonna to have to pay the tax on an accelerated basis, which is another reason why to consider a Roth conversion to pay the tax now so that your beneficiaries don't get clobbered in income tax based on the SECURE Act. So that's another reason why to consider uh, the Roth or, or looking at getting tax efficient. So kind of think of it as the pros and cons uh, of getting tax efficient. Not necessarily just a Roth conversion, but just getting more tax efficient. Um, so obvious pro is with the Secure Act, beneficiaries uh, will pay less in tax. So looking at it from a, a legacy standpoint. Um, so we've been talking about this as we saw this debt bubble continue to grow, and then really, the government gave us this window of opportunity, and that window of opportunity is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed in 2018. And what it did is lower marginal tax rates across the board. So prior to 2018, if you were um, earning $100,000, you were in the 25% tax bracket. Well, when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed, now if you're at that same $100,000 income level, you're at a 22% tax rate. Uh, and that's set to expire originally when the bill was passed in 2025. But now all signs pointing to a Biden pre presidency, uh, he's ran on the fact that he wants to repeal the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So this could happen as soon as 2021 or 2022. So this window of opportunity that we had where you're, 22, uh, you're at a 22% tax rate right now, guess what, that's gonna go up to 25% whenever this is repealed. If you're at 24, then that's gonna go up to 28%. So 
with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, if the SECURE Act uh, benefits your beneficiaries, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act benefits you, uh, and you would pay just less tax in retirement if you move money from the tax deferred account to the tax free by paying the tax. Because I would rather pay a 22% tax now than a 25% tax in the future. Because that's what's going to happen when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act ends. Plus, on top of that, we still have to deal with this debt. So the taxes might go even higher than just being raised three to 4% across the board. Because the government, we have to address this somehow. And we either need to cut spending, uh, print money, which is just going to raise inflation, that's not going to help anyone, or raise taxes. And I don't see the government cutting spending anytime soon. So I, I foresee a lot of stealth taxes, and we've already had one in the SECURE Act. Uh, Biden has one where he talks about getting rid of step up and basis, as well as just across the board tax raises. And that's what repealing the tax, tax Cuts and Jobs Act does. Now, not to get political, Biden ran on this promise that he's not raising taxes on anyone less than $400,000. Well, guess what? The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is going to affect people who earn, uh, I was talking to a family today, they have about 80, um, they have $53,000 of taxable income. Uh, they have about 80,000, you back out the standard deduction. So right now they're in the 12% tax bracket. Well, even for them, it makes sense to do the Roth conversion or move money from the tax deferred account, pay the tax and move it somewhere else. Because if they do it now, they fill up that tax bracket where now they're gonna pay uh, 12% tax on the $30,000 of space they have in their bracket versus if they wait until the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act expires, they're gonna pay 15%. And guess what? They earn less than 400,000. So uh, taxes are going up across the board as soon as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act ends. Um, so we have the debt, we have the SECURE Act, we have the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Now, so what's the big benefit of, of paying the tax or doing a Roth conversion or getting tax efficient? I think, and we can run the numbers and we have some reports that we run for our clients to demonstrate this. But at the end of the day, it's just flat out paying or um, paying less tax. Now you need to consider that it's kind of ripping off a Band-Aid, so to speak. It hurts when you do it, but after that you're free. So I guess what would be a con of doing this is you pay the tax up front. Um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily a con, but people always look at taxes through this micro lens of minimizing taxes in a specific year. Well, guess what? We're gonna raise your taxes in a specific year to minimize taxes for the rest of your retirement. Um, so one downside is, yes, uh, you have to rip off the Band-Aid, and yes, you have to pay tax now. Well, that tax you pay now might be $20,000, versus if you continue to defer, the tax you pay over the lifetime of that account could easily be $50,000 or $100,000 on that same account. Um, and I can run the numbers to show you this, to prove this to you. And very simply, uh, and I've done this before, here's a very simple example. Let's say we have $100,000 pre-tax, $80,000 post-tax, and let's assume a 20% tax rate. Okay, So if we have this $100,000 IRA, and we have a 20% tax, let's just keep the math even, and this is over an, a, a something tax-free like a Roth, okay, to get it over there, all we have to do is pay the tax. And what would the tax be? $20,000, right? And then I hear this misconception that, well, if I leave it pre-taxed, it's a bigger number, so it's going to benefit me more getting the growth, right? Well, that's a misconception. So let's assume both of these accounts go up 10%. So now the $100,000 is at $110,000. The $80,000 uh, goes up 10% uh, is at $88,000, right? So the question is, is this the same amount? Well, we got to still pay our tax, which is 20%. And 20% of 110 is going to equal 88,000. So at the end of the day, from a cash flow standpoint, for your pocket, Assuming taxes remain exactly the same, it doesn't benefit you to defer paying taxes. Who does it benefit? Well, if you pay the tax up front, you're paying $20,000. If you defer the tax, you're paying $22,000. So if you want to pay less tax, then chances are you want to move money out of these tax deferred accounts sooner rather than later. 
Now, another con of doing a Roth conversion or moving money out of the tax deferred accounts to somewhere tax free or taxable is that it can affect your Social Security. Um, but if you're already making more than $44,000, your Social Security is already getting taxed. So if you already have more than $44,000 worth of income, it doesn't affect your Social Security any differently because your Social Security is already getting taxed. 85% of your Social Security is added on to your income. So it does not affect your Social Security if you're already making over 44,000. What it does affect in the year that you move the money, the year that you move the money, it does affect your Medicare premiums. Uh, and actually it's a two year lag. So if you were to have done conversions or moved money out of the tax deferred accounts in 2018, you're gonna see that your Medicare premiums might be an extra couple hundred dollars higher depending on how much you converted just for this year. And then if we move forward, it's gonna drop back down to whatever it was pre-conversion. Um, pre so in the year you do the moving the money out of the IRA, like a Roth conversion, uh, you're going to see two years in the future, your Medicare premiums will be higher for that year. But I'll argue, and we can run the math for you, depending on your situation, but the tax savings and the peace of mind of knowing that if taxes go up, that you've already removed this money from the, the, the tax uh, train that's coming down the tracks, uh, that's gonna far outweigh potentially uh, the additional Medicare premiums you might be paying. So um, for a lot of our clients, what we're doing is we're just looking at their taxes, figuring out where the tax brackets are at, figuring out how much space we have to move, and then moving that money. And just from a, a tax planning standpoint, a lot of times it's a no-brainer. Um, and if, it, if you want to see how this applies to your situation, uh, just schedule some time with me, uh, 15chris.com. Uh, I need to see your tax return, your last tax return and then we can run the numbers and, and play around with this. Um, this is something that I was doing with client or even earlier today. Uh, they set up an asset protection trust. We're pulling the money out of the IRAs and it looks like we could pull about $40,000 out of the IRA, still keeping them at their same tax bracket before going up into another tax bracket. It made sense because now we got more money into the asset protection trust uh, and it made sense because it was just good tax planning because instead of paying a 15% uh, tax rate in the future when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act ends, they're just gonna pay 12. And I always view it as if we can put more money in your pocket, uh, less in Uncle Sam's, uh, we're gonna be in a better, uh, better position. Really appreciate your conversation with education pros and cons. Um, thanks, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, so the comment was, it appreciates looking at the pros and cons. And that's really everything that we do for our clients is we're looking at it from a, educational and best interest standpoint. We just wanna do what's in the best interest of the client. And we need to look to see how these different things fit together. Um, because if I were to just say, hey, everyone go out and do a Roth conversion, uh, and then two years later, you're seeing your Medicare premiums going skyrocketing for the year you're doing the conversion, uh, you would be upset. But we walk into this from an educational standpoint of knowing uh, the effect of our decisions. And understand, not taking action is a decision in itself. Um, if you don't think about these things, if you're not considering the tax planning, uh, again, you're just uh, putting yourself to the whim, especially in those pre-tax accounts uh, of wherever taxes go. Because if taxes go up three, four, 10%, the value of your pre-tax IRAs drops that much, right? And so we're all concerned about volatility in terms of our investments. And we have diversification. We wouldn't have all of our investments, hopefully in one stock, right? Similarly with taxes, we need to defer, diversify our tax buckets. So, and I, I sit down with a lot of clients uh, and they've accumulated all this wealth pre-tax and now they're at retirement and they're at the same, if not higher tax bracket moving into retirement. And it's again, not necessarily their fault. First of all, some of these things weren't around, like Roths weren't around a number of years ago, or there's income limitations on Roths. And that's where we get into some of the Roth alternatives like index universal life or cash value life. Um, but it's in the government's best interest for you to defer paying taxes. Just how I described, if you defer, if you pay the tax now, it might be a $20,000 tax bill. If you defer, it might be a $22,000 tax bill. Now imagine instead of doing that on $100,000, we're doing that on a million dollars or uh, meeting with someone with uh, the other day with five and a half million and a majority of it was pre-tax. 
And so this isn't something where we liquidate necessarily everything in one year, but on an annual basis, looking at, at these tax brackets. And again, there's a window of opportunity with this uh, based on that Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And then the fact that we're $30 trillion in debt is pretty darn scary as well. All right, so that is the pros and cons of the Roth conversion. Um, I guess another con, and I apologize, I'm, I'm trying to kind of think of as many as I can, um, but to be honest, I think for a majority of people, um, considering the Roth conversion or moving money to the uh, more tax efficient bucket makes a lot of sense. Um, the other con that I hear sometimes is that, well, if you move the money to the Roth, you're supposed to leave it there for five years, uh, which is true. So to get the tax growth, to get that tax free, um, because again, that's the benefit is now this money is tax free, tax free for your retirement, tax free for what you leave to your kids. Um, but uh, for it to be the growth to be tax free, you're supposed to leave it there for five years, which a lot of people bring this up as a, a downside of the Roth. Uh, but in reality, the Roth, because you want to take advantage of this tax free growth, you, you want it accumulating growth in a tax free manner. Uh, typically, the Roth is going to be the last of the money that you're going to touch because we want it to continue to grow tax free. So I don't see the uh, five year rule of, of taking money out of the Roth as, as really being an issue. Um, a downside of a Roth conversion, um, and this isn't referring to moving money tax-free, is that you have to be the owner of a Roth. So a downside of a Roth is that um, it's not asset protected. So if you're to need nursing home care or long-term care, the money inside of a Roth would not be protected. That's where if we set up an asset protection trust, we can't put a Roth into an asset protection trust. If you want something that is tax-free, that can grow tax-free and you want it inside of that asset protection trust, then we'd look at things like index universal life or cash value life insurance, where the value of this grows tax-free, you can pull the money out, that income that you pull out comes out tax-free, uh, and then there's also potentially a death benefit as well as long-term care benefit, but that could be owned by the trust. So one downside of the Roth is that a trust or asset protection trust cannot own it, uh, nor can it own the IRA. So it's not like a pro and con of whether to do the conversion. It's just something specific with the Roth, where sometimes we don't use the Roth as a conversion, but we still look for something in that tax-free bucket. Um, and again, it's just every family situation is a little bit different, and that's something that makes this, uh, for me, and uh, fun, intellectually stimulating. All right. Uh, what is the five-year rule for Roth? Is the Roth account must be open five years or the investment in the Roth must be five years? I'm wondering about the momentum of growth on the IRA pre-tax being diminished in established momentum growth for a post-tax. Um, you have to open up the Roth uh, and then once that Roth is opened, then um, you have five years. Uh, you're supposed to leave it there five years. Um, Okay, so, uh, okay, uh, the second question is the momentum. Um, and this is kind of what I was talking about in that, um, let me share my screen again real quick. So the question is with regards to the momentum of growth pre-tax, but now if you were to put it into a, a Roth or IUL, um, it's on a smaller amount. And so now you should be seeing my screen again. Um, that's exactly what I'm trying to illustrate right down, uh, right down here. So this is what I'm talking about is, okay, we have $100,000 pre-tax, $80,000 post-tax. Let's call it in a Roth. That's the easiest way to understand it. And let's say both of these are in the same mutual fund. Let's say it's an XYZ mutual fund, okay? So we have XYZ mutual fund inside of an IRA, XYZ mutual fund, and then we have XYZ mutual fund inside of the Roth. And a, a misconception I see a lot of times is that, well, the $100,000 is gonna grow and you're going to get more bang for your buck because you're growing a bigger amount. But if we have it invested in the same exact thing, both of these accounts go up 10%, so that $100,000 goes to 110, that $80,000 goes to 88,000. Are you getting more value? The answer is no, because what you, all you're doing is you're growing a bigger tax bill. So at the end of the day, you're not getting any additional growth or value or acceleration on this bigger pre-tax number 
because all you're doing is really growing a tax bill. Because again, we're assuming that both of these accounts go up 10%. 10% 10 of 100,000 is 110, 10% of 80,000 is 88,000. Okay, now the 88,000 is already post-tax. The 110,000, we still have to pay the tax and it's still at 20%. And 20% of 110 equals 22,000. And so we pay the tax, 22,000, and now we're left with the same exact number. All we've done is we've grown a bigger tax bill. In the Roth, if you were to pay the tax right away, you pay 20,000. If you leave it pre-tax and you pay the tax later after you've experienced more growth, you're paying 22,000. And that's just on 100,000. So again, by leaving it pre-tax, it's not like you're growing your nest egg anymore. You're growing the tax bill for the government. And that's why the passage of the SECURE Act is so scary to me because it's in the, benefit, in the government's best interest to have you defer paying the tax. But the SECURE Act is saying, hey, as a government, we're broke. We need to pull that money in sooner rather than later because this debt bubble is just growing and growing and growing. So um, again, it, the, um, leaving it pre-tax, growing it inside of this pre-tax bucket uh, doesn't necessarily benefit you, even though you would think it would because it's a bigger number. What it does is it benefits the government because they're getting a bigger tax bill at the end of the day. And then if you factor if taxes go up in the future, let's say it's a 20% tax now, but if they raise the tax to say 30% in the future, well, guess what? Um, not only has the tax bill went up, but the value of this has went down. I can't do the math off the top of my head, but now this might be only like 75,000 that you can pull out of here because of the additional tax in the future. So I, I hate to say like beating a dead horse, but there's a lot of advantages of, of getting tax efficient. I think this is the biggest risk um, and the biggest opportunity, uh, window of opportunity that we have right now. Uh, all right, so now let's get into this next question. And I've been talking so much on Zooms and phone calls, my headset's dying. So I'm gonna have to do a little headset switch. So feel free to type in any questions uh, while I do this switch and give me just a moment. All right, you should be able to hear me still. So if someone could just type in the chat, if you can hear me, that'd be great. Uh, yep, perfect, all right. Now let's get back to um, the other question that was submitted uh, just as I was logging on, uh, has to do with long-term care. Right. And, all right, so the question, um, let me write it out so everyone can see, regarding long-term care, how do you decide if you should self-fund or continue with a policy? So do we self-fund or it sounds like we have a pure traditional long-term care? Uh, long-term care, all right, so, there's different approaches for long-term care. So how do we address the long-term care issue? And, and this is, um, I think there's three big risks right now. One of them is market risk with all the volatility we've see, been seeing, the 12 year bull run we had. Uh, we had a little bit of a gut punch in March with the pandemic, but you see the unemployment. Uh, I had a call with a client who's a commercial realtor who sees some things in the commercial real estate market. Um, so I think market volatility moving forward will be something to watch. Uh, but the two big risks after that, or in addition to that, are tax risk and long-term care risk. So how do we address long-term care? Um, there's a couple options. So uh, first, we could self-fund. So we just pay out of our own money. Uh, second, we can look at uh, traditional long-term care insurance. Um, third. 
we can look at what's called asset-based long-term care strategies. Uh, fourth, we can look at legal entities. Um, uh, and I guess uh, fifth, we can look at income strategies where we structure the income uh, to be able to cover long-term care costs. So uh, self-funding, uh, you have to have the funds to do it. Um, in the past, they said, uh, uh, back when there's really only two options, traditional long-term care insurance, um, and uh, this has a lot of disadvantages now. Uh, one is the increasing premiums, so the premiums can go up on you at any time. Uh, I've had clients that bought a policy uh, before working with us, pay on it for 20 years at $4,000 a year, and then they increase the premium to $10,000. Um, and you have to decide whether you keep the policy, let it lapse, go in a different direction. Uh, also, there's no benefit at death. So kind of the old paradigm where these were the only two options, a lot of times there was kind of a rule of thumb um, where traditional long-term care insurance would be really for individuals who had between 500,000 to 1.5 million worth of assets. Anything less than that, um, then you kind of need those funds for retirement. Um, anything more than that, uh, you wouldn't necessarily need to cover this in terms of an insurance. Um, because with this old traditional, there's no death benefit. So you could pay on this your whole life and there'd be nothing left at the end of the day. Um, now, I'm not a big fan in most cases of this type of policy anymore. Um, if you have an existing policy, you may want to continue it, uh, depending on where you're at, you are. Uh, but what we do is we figure out, A, do we stick with this current policy or do we look at one of these other options? Um, and so self-funding is an option. You just use your assets and, and, and pay for care. Um, but now we have some other options. Um, Asset-based long-term care, uh, this is a strategy I am a big fan of. Um, and this isn't always just about covering the long-term care need. A lot of times it's about just leveraging your assets, where even if you have, say, $5 million, you might want to consider an asset-based long-term care strategy. Uh, if you only have $100,000, you might want to consider an asset-based long-term care strategy. There's different ways that it could be structured. Um, but let's say, and I'm just making up numbers right now, um, let's say we have $750,000 uh, of investments. Maybe we carve out a portion of that, let's call it $250,000. So we're just moving it from one pocket to the other pocket. We could always move it back. But now that 250,000 based on your age and health is turned into a bucket of funds. And I'm just making up numbers right now. Let's call it $600,000. And this needs to be used for either long-term care or a death benefit. So we've turned 250,000 into 600,000 worth of either long-term care benefits or death benefits. If you need long-term care, then you can spend down that $600,000. Uh, if let's say you use 500,000 and there's $100,000 left over, now we can leave, now that would go to the beneficiaries tax-free. So this is about leveraging your current assets. Um, this could also be something that you pay on over time as well to fill it up, but really it's just a um, uh, leveraging your current assets to address two things. One that may happen and the other that for sure will. One is you may need long-term care. Three out of four of us will need long-term care at some point. Uh, and the average cost of a nursing home right now is eight to $12,000 a month. Uh, and then also you're gonna pass away at some point. We haven't figured out a way around that. So what we're doing is we're turning basically, based on your age and health, so there's some underwriting for this, $250,000 into 600,000 of long-term care or death benefit. Leaving the remaining, uh, I can't do math in my head, $500,000 that could be used for the rest of your retirement. Plus, uh, this money would be tax-free to whoever inherits it, as well as the long-term care benefit is tax-free. So a lot of times what we're doing with people that have traditional long-term care policies is, is looking to see, does 
transitioning to an asset-based long-term care offer you more of a benefit? Maybe it will, maybe it won't, depending on when you got that policy. Um, so it's a little bit hit or miss. Sometimes we will stay in that traditional policy because maybe it's, uh, we've been, we got it 20 years ago when we're younger and healthier. And, and now if we're to try to go through underwriting, it won't work. Um, and then number four would be legal entities. Uh, so this is something that uh, our uh, law practice has spent a lot of time perfecting. Uh, we have an asset protection trust that we move assets into the trust. And once we make it five years, everything is protected from that nursing home or Medicaid spend down. And we could put things like your home and investments inside of here. Uh, and because Medicaid has a five year look back period, everything inside of the trust would be protected. Um, so that's a strategy as well. Maybe we look at, okay, let's stop paying $4,000 a year, $5,000 a year on a traditional long-term care insurance when we can just move over to a legal entity, pay for it once. And now once we make it five years, 100% of what we put in is protected from that devastating nursing home cost. So that might be an option as well. And I've had people that do that as well, or even combinations of both of these as well, where the asset-based long-term care covers things like home care, um, assisted living, uh, but we don't want to overfund it. And then we have the legal entity protect against the nursing home care. And then fifth strategy is more of an income strategy where we look at your income sources, social security, pensions. Uh, and then if we can draw on your assets, uh, maybe something like a fixed index annuity that normally would pay out, let's say $2,000 per month. But now if you were to need long-term care after two years, uh, then the payout could double to uh, $4,000 per month uh, if you're to need home care, or assisted living, or, or nursing home care. Um, the nice thing about this is there's no underwriting. We just have to wait two years. So even if you had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or something like that, um, this would be a strategy to leverage those assets without having to go through underwriting to create more income to cover home care, or assisted living, or nursing home care. Uh, so those are really the, the planning strategies as it relates to long-term care. Uh, and I'm not saying everyone should rush out and drop their traditional long-term care insurance. I'm just saying that typically it's not something we're looking at moving forward uh, for families. Uh, and if you already have one, I'm not saying drop it. I'm saying let's look at the other options. And one of them might be to keep that traditional long-term care insurance policy. But now there's new strategies, new options that are available. See if any of them make more sense. Uh, and then if they do, uh, then only at that point would we consider dropping that long-term care. Because I always want to make sure you're in a better spot. So uh, that's, that's kind of how we take a look at the uh, long-term care question. Uh, okay, any other questions? Uh, the running momentum. Uh, I opened a Roth five years ago in 2015 with an, an ad in 2020. How does the five year rule apply? Um, to be honest, I'm drawing a blank. I'll get you, a, I'll email you uh, the answer to that. Uh, the question is when you open up the Roth, um, is the five year rule from the time that you open the Roth and then you could add money later, or is it from the time that the money moves into the account on the growth? Um, my inkling, and I just have to double check it, and I don't know off the top of my head, I only have so much space in, in my head. Uh, my inkling is that it's from when you opened the account, uh, and then you could put more money in later, and it's just from when you open the account, but I have to double check that. Uh, I'm just blanking on that right now. Um, we'll call, call it, uh, uh, a senior moment on my part. So um, I'll, I'll email you an answer to that. Plus I'll make sure to answer that on the next um, next meeting. Uh, any other questions? Uh, because I've exhausted the ones that have been submitted. Uh, if you do have a question, feel free to put it in the question and answer. Uh, and it looks like nothing else is coming in. So with that, I wanted to thank everyone. Oh, here we go. Here's a question. Up, oh, someone said thank you. You are very welcome. I appreciate it. Uh, all right. So with that, I want to thank everyone. Uh, look forward to our next one. We will be doing one. Uh, let's see. I'm checking the calendar right now. Uh, so we will be doing one next week and the following week, but we'll probably be skipping uh, the 23rd and the 30th, the last two weeks of the month.
Uh, but I look forward to continuing this uh, uh, moving into next year, especially given uh, kind of the social distancing and, and everything. We don't have the opportunity to do our normal live workshops uh, where I get to see everyone's face. Uh, but I do appreciate everyone logging in. Uh, again, we had a good number of people, over 20 plus people uh, on the Zoom today. Uh, so I appreciate uh, you spending time with me and I appreciate uh, you uh, finding value in, in what we're providing here. So with that, I want to thank everyone. Uh, make it a great week as I'm dodging the sun that's coming in. Uh, thank you so much. Take care.